Well, let's go ahead and start where we did this morning, Philippians chapter 2. And we'll start in verse 5. I just, I just love the, the Holy Ghost. I, I never cease to be amazed. And I didn't find out I had this morning's service till 7.05. And as soon as I turned inward to what I mean to the Lord to say, well, what do you want to, what do you want to say? I heard, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, which is Philippians 2, 5. That's where we're going here in a minute. Then we get here for the 830 service. I'm supposed to do the 10. We get here for the 830 service. And where does Alan go? Philippians chapter 2, let this mind be in you. And I'm going, you already, get, you already did that service through Alan. <laughs> But I had part two, and actually I think you could call this one part three almost, part three. So, uh, but you won't need to hear the first two before you hear this one, it'll be fine. Now tonight's lesson, someone lock the door before I give the title. Hmm. Suffering according to the will of God. What? I'm, <laughs> Bernard says, I'm going back home, that's it. <laughs> I'm going back home. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to that verse near the end, but uh, Peter, that there really are two kinds of sufferings that are according to God's work, uh, will. So I'll just go ahead and tell you now so I don't forget. Sickness is not one of them. You hear that? Never, ever, nowhere, ever do you find that being the will of God, okay? Yet that's the only kind growing up in a denominational church that I ever heard about. And they were almost proud of how they were willing to worship God in the middle of their sickness. And I'm not against that. But in their mind, somehow God was pleased that they were suffering so terribly, yet still loving him. Well, I'm glad you love him while you're suffering, but that's not the kind of suffering, not with sickness, that God gets any, any uh, that's, that's according to his will. I'm going to stay real close here. Pre don't turn here yet, we'll be here at the end. We're going to eventually be tonight at 1 Peter 4, verses 12 through 19. Verse 19 says, Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God. What? Let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. There is such a thing as suffering that is according to the will of God. Well, let's get there. Let's back up. All right, so Philippians chapter 2, we'll just start here again, starting in verse 5. Let this mind be in you. If you underline, uh, that, that really is the subject for chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4. He doesn't change the subject as we saw this morning. Talking about uh, uh, how Jesus himself here, just like he says, the mind that he had on the inside of him. I am going to obey my Father, even if I have to die on the cross. Well, let this mind be in you, which was first in Christ Jesus. I am going to obey my Lord, even if I have to put my flesh on the cross daily. Remember we looked at Luke chapter 9 this morning? So anyway, let's read here a little bit. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. Now, if you underline, I really recommend you underline that, that phrase, obedient unto death even the death of the cross wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father now remember we underlined in verse 8 that he was obedient unto death Verse 5 says, let this mind be in you. And look at verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always, what? Obeyed. Obeyed. He has not changed the subject. Obedient unto death. And like we did this morning, keep your, you just, you just flip over one page in my Bible. Over to chapter 3, verse 10. 
that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death obedient unto death being made conformable to his death have you ever heard of a message called mortification <laughs> mortification see in this next verse I didn't know what it meant for years if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. You ought to read, no, don't read some of the commentaries about that verse. Or they get into the first resurrection and the second resurrection and the end time stuff. And he's not talking about that at all. And since we're reviewing, just hold your place. Go to Romans 6. This is the power of assimilation. Unlocking a mis a mis when you un unlock a mystery in one book, it'll unlock a mystery in another book. What does he mean that I may attain? under the resurrection of the dead. What is it? What in the world, you know? Is he talking about some special... I've read all kinds of stuff about that in the future, you know? No? What he's talking about here in Romans 6, verse 4, verse 3. <laughs> Sorry. My bad. <laughs> verse 3. Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. See, spiritually, that's already happened. Your spirit, that old Adamic spirit, died the death the day you were born again. Now, we're bringing the rest of us into subjection here, see? See, therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Over in Philippians, he says that I might attain to the resurrection of the dead. I need to be made conformable to his death. And I also need to walk in the power of his resurrection. Just to make sure we didn't, that, that we get it here. Uh, look at verse, uh, let's see, verse 4. Let's read that again. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father. Even so, we also should walk in newness of life, for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. That's the resurrection that Paul is talking about. You have already been raised from the dead. You've already, this is a past history event. When you got born again, you died in him, you were quickened with him, raised up together with him, what Paul is talking about here is this mortification process and uh, transformation process that we don't just know those things in theory, but that we literally walk in it. That's why he says, I don't, I don't count myself to have attained, but I'm pressing towards that mark. Well, hallelujah, so are we. Say amen to somebody. Amen. All right, so let me just tell you this. Uh, there are two types of suffering that are according to God's will. We're going to look at several verses here. Number one is the kind Romans 6 is talking about. Striving against sin. Because your flesh will still like it. My flesh would still. I mean, I have to mortify every time I drive by that Krispy Kreme donut place out there. Yeah, thank God I was never on drugs. I thank God for that because I have an addictive personality. I know that. I'm an all or nothing guy. I can never have been able to cut. cut I never have been able to cut down on nothing. It's. Yes, no, live, die, sink, swim. That's Gary. <laughs> you know, can't, I can't do it. I, a lot of people can taper off. My mom can do that. She can just taper off stuff, you know. I can't do that. It's, uh, it's black and white, live or die, sink or swim. That's all or nothing. <laughs> you know, that, that's how I am. So I'm glad that I never got on drugs. If I had a hard, hard enough time giving up cigarettes, I can't imagine, you know, my, my heart goes out to people that have to get off crack and, and heroin and other things, you know, but it can be done. God's, God's, God's grace and his power is stronger than your addiction. And may, that's one of the sufferings, though. That, that suffering in the flesh. The flesh, I don't know if, if people, people that say things like, all you have to do is go seven days without that thing and you'll be free. <laughs> Those people were never addicted to nothing. <laughs> they don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> It takes a lot longer than seven days, okay? It takes more than seven weeks, in my case. It took a long time. But I'm telling you, it's been over a decade now, and you can be free. Where it's not ever even a thought anymore. Glory to God. Hallelujah. 
Well, there's a, stri there's a suffering in the flesh. My flesh? Are you kidding? After me feeding it nicotine for 42 years? Then I decided I was going to not give it to it anymore. My flesh said it was going to kill me. <laughs> Made me feel like I was going to die. My emotions? I, wanted, I, had, I can't even tell you the number of times I thought about driving off the cliff. <laughs> I mean, you know, it was a war. And God is okay with that suffering right there. That kind of suffering? Striving against sin? When you've been addicted to something or... Uh, and, okay, and I'm, I'm talking about smoking. We could be talking about lots of things. Uh, I want to talk about real bad things, and then I want to talk about worse things. A real bad thing would be like pornography. That's real bad. Gossip is worse. It really is. Gossip is murder. It really is. You're killing people with your words. Proverbs is full of analogy of how the words are like a sword and a, a dagger. You know, and you, you can forgive people. It's one thing to forgive, it's another to be healed. Okay, I'm not going to get into it. That's a whole other teaching. But the point, one of the, one of the kinds of suffering that is according to the will of God is when you put your, you take, your spirit man gets strong enough, you take a stand against your flesh, and something that you know is sin, something you know may not be an outward type, sin like smoking and pornography and drinking and those kind of things could be those or it could be worse things <laughs> gossip envy jealousy other things like that all of those there's a suffering involved because you're readjusting to who you really are and the flesh doesn't like to give up nothing have you ever found that out yet the flesh is crazy you know, you give it one Krispy Kreme, it wants two boxes of Krispy Kreme. I mean, it's nuts. Anyway. The other kind of suffering that is according to the will of God, it's okay with it, is persecution for righteousness sake. Jesus promised us we would have it. He said, if they believe me, they'll believe you. If they hated me, they're going to hate you. The world is going to hate you because you're not of the world. For years, we didn't have a whole lot of that in this nation. Now we're getting it more and more and more. And if we keep going on the path, track we're on, you're going to know what it is to suffer for righteousness sake, unless you compromise. You know. Well, let's go ahead and go over to, uh, let's see, we did these verses this morning. Um, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Go ahead. Let's review also Romans 8. we got time. Go to Romans 8 for just a minute. Hallelujah. Starting in verse 16. Uh, 15, 14. <laughs> okay, 13. <laughs> For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit, and from this morning and from Dave's teaching on the born again trail, you know that's a little less. He gave you the new nature is what he gave you to have power over your flesh. Now the Holy Spirit will also help you against your infirmities. But the first and primary way that he conquered sin in you was giving you a nature that is not sinful. A righteous, holy nature made in the image of Christ. And God's power in that nature is stronger than your puny flesh. Now your, flu your puny flesh... <laughs> your, your puny flesh... <laughs> will kick and scream and like mine did and that's not the only thing I mean I talked this morning about you know give it, it, worse things give your pickup away to your worst enemy what see there's the flesh is more than the physical appetites it's ego man and they shouldn't have done me that way they have no right to treat me like that what are we supposed to do pray for them no <laughs> do good to them what Give them your pickup, your worst enemy. What pickup? I only had one. Man, but the nature that he put on the inside of you is able to overcome even the emotional things of the flesh, the emotional parts of the soul. Hmm. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you, through the Spirit, new nature, do mortify, put to death the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God. And that, again, should be a little less. He's not talking about the Holy Ghost there. 
There is a leadership that comes by the Holy Ghost, but that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about that leadership that comes from the new nature. They are the sons of God. Your old flesh wants to do stuff it used to do, and there's a new spirit on the end. There's a new sheriff in town. He's called the new nature. <laughs> You're fixing to do something you've always done, and that new nature says no. You don't even, the Holy, it, the Holy Ghost will come and bear witness, but that's not the first leadership. The first leadership is that new nature. It says no, you can't do that. Well, I want to do that. Well, the war is on, isn't it? It's Galatians 5. The spirit lusts against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit. And these two are the contrary to one another that you cannot do the things which you allow. <laughs> you know, the flesh wants one thing and God's nature in you wants another. And there's a struggle and a war. And God's okay with that, but he wants you to win. Okay, for as many as are led by the new nature, the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. <clears throat> for you have not received, <clears throat> excuse me, for you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption. Again, that should be a little less. The Holy Ghost didn't get adopted. <laughs> you got adopted. <laughs> There's a nature on the inside of you now crying, Abba, Father. Whereby we cry, Abba, Father. See, that's your nature. Now we have the Holy Ghost. The Spirit, the Holy Ghost itself, bears witness with our spirit. There you have both of them in one verse. The Holy Spirit... Your reborn again spirit, that we are the children of God. And I love the first half of verse 17. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. And don't you wish it ended right there? <laughs> oh, there's more? If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. What kind of suffering is he talking about here? Well, it only makes sense in the context that it's given. This is not talking about persecution for righteousness sake. This is talking about victory over your flesh. We've gone, we've gone through Romans 6. Romans 7 is the guy who was given the law, but he had no nature to keep it. With his mind, he agreed that the law was good, and he set everything in him to keep it. Anyone ever do that? Anyone ever, you know? And the trouble of it is, he found another law working in his members, a law of sin and death. There's no way man could get free without a Savior. All the best efforts in the world. If even one man could perfectly keep the law, then Christ died in vain. But nobody could keep it. They could offer the sacrifices and be justified by it. But nobody could perfectly keep the law. So what he's talking about here is rising above sin. You remember in Romans 6, it says, Shall we continue in sin that grace should abound? God forbid. But there is a suffering in the flesh. When you make up your mind, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm not going to do it anymore. And you're doing it now, not by mind power. That's all the guy in Romans 7 had. The power of his mind. Now you're doing it by a new spirit, which is of God, that lives on the inside of you. And you can walk free from sin. But as you do, that doesn't mean the flesh is real happy about it. And there is a suffering. What he's talking about here, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. I like how Dave said it one time. He said, you get born again. Let's say you get born again at a really young age. And you don't, you, you don't go home to be with the Lord till you're 120. You lived at your full 100. So over 100 years of striving against the flesh. Keeping your foot on the neck of the flesh. Not allowing the flesh to win. You put your foot right on the neck. A whole lifetime of struggle and suffering and keeping the flesh down. He says that whole lifetime won't even be compared to that first moment. In glory. That first moment when you receive that new body. That first moment. And you've got all eternity to live with Christ. And enjoy it. He says, the sufferings of this life, they're not even worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. And so you'll know that he's talking about overcoming the flesh here. More so than persecution for righteousness. Just come on down to verse 26. He says that, so everything he's saying here is how the new nature helps you overcome the flesh and not have to live like the guy in Romans 7. 
But now likewise, the Spirit also, and if you underline, you really ought to underline also, because it's continuing the thought. Yeah, that new nature that he gave you, that's what empowers you to have victory over the flesh. But God didn't even stop there. He gave you the Holy Spirit, who also helpeth our what? That's the weaknesses of the flesh. That's the things in us, not just appetites, but strongholds, wrong doctrine, everything in the world that keeps us from fulfilling the Holy Ghost. Also, in addition to that new nature, helps us. But boy, that doesn't mean there's not a struggle and a suffering in the flesh as you, as you grow and mature. All right, let's go over now to 1 Peter chapter 4. Hallelujah. And we find almost that same wording. You know, we started this off in Philippians 2.5. It says, let this mind be in you. Now watch this as we get into 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. And I'm waiting. I hear pages turning. I want you to see it in your Bible. You all okay? Hallelujah. I would serve you Starbucks, but we don't have any. So. Hallelujah. It says, for as much then as Christ hath there's that word, suffered for us in the flesh. Arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. What? I'm a faith man. I don't believe in no suffering. <laughs> well, there's two kinds of suffering. That if you're really going God's path for your life, there's two kinds you're going you're gonna to fight, you're going to face. One is this suffering. Um, striving against sin and the other is persecution suffering persecution for righteousness sake well you can sure see that coming strong in our in our land but anyway for as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh arm yourselves likewise with the same mind let's do that for a minute <clears throat> just say this after me if words mean anything okay Christ suffered in the flesh I arm myself with the same mind. I also will suffer in the flesh. Amen. Now see, that's what he's talking about. It's real popular in the churches today, this passage. <laughs> For he that hath suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Now sometimes, I'll just go ahead and tell you, y'all have heard this. You see, I was an alcoholic or a virtual alcoholic. I never was diagnosed, but I think I probably was for t about 10 years, a good 10 years. And, and I mean, I, would I know I'd break out in a cold sweat. If, I, if, I, if it dawned on me, I was somewhere and I had no access to alcohol and I was trapped. I mean, I'd break out in a cold sweat. It was, I so depended on it. I had it everywhere. In, the, in those days, I wore, you wouldn't believe it now, but I wore a suit all the time in those days. I had a flask in my inside coat pocket. I always had a bottle, one in the glove box and another one in the trunk somewhere. I had it everywhere. I mean, I didn't want it. I had it in the bottom right drawer of my desk, you know. And uh, I mean, I, you know, and I was a functional alcoholic. Um, and, and uh, you know, I could still do my business. But when that one, after I got saved, I mean, Michael Muccio, you know, led us to the Lord and it wasn't the very first night, but it was sometime in the first week. I wish I'd have kept a better record of it. All I, I don't even remember praying about it. I mean, the first few days, I was just sitting there smoking like a freight train, bourbon and coke, and reading my Bible, and crying and loving Jesus. Boy, holiness preachers would have a heyday with that, wouldn't they? <laughs> I tell you that there was a thing going on between me and the Lord now. And I'll be honest with you, I don't even remember praying about that one. All I know is I went to bed like that one night, and I woke up the next day sober, and I've never had another drink since. That was over 30 years ago, and I've never had a withdrawal symptom. So he can deliver you without withdrawals. But he didn't when it come to the cigarettes. <laughs> I'm telling you right now, <laughs> thought I was going to die. <laughs> The way I look at it now, because I was a lot older, I think I should have probably given up a lot sooner than I did. I don't know. Now, this is Gary's opinion, what I'm saying right now. I don't know. He has not told me. But I do know the end result. The price that I had to pay with those withdrawals, 
I don't ever want to pay that price again. So if there's ever even a little thought of maybe I ought to just have one, you know, as pressure comes, you know, maybe just one wouldn't hurt. I think about that, that suffering. <laughs> no, I'm not going to go through that again. Uh -uh, this pressure is nothing compared to that. I'm not going through that again. Anyway, that's Gary's opinion. I don't know if that's right or not. All right. <laughs> okay, let's finish up this. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. In Hebrews, again, I don't think I wrote this verse down. Yeah, I did. Uh, you don't have to turn there, but you know, Hebrews 12, verses 2 and 4, says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds, you have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. He wasn't striving against sin on the cross. He was bearing our sin on the cross. Where did he strive unto blood? Resist unto blood, striving against sin. That's in the garden. I mean, it plainly tells you three times he had to go back. Now, normally Jesus prays once, I think. <laughs> Three times he had to go back and pray, Father, not my will, but thine be done. Not my will, but thine be done. He understands that there is a war between that natural you and the spiritual you, if you'll allow me. There was something going on there. He says, not my will, but thine be done. And the, the pressure, I read about it one time. It's a 16-cylinder word that I can't pronounce, but... It's, it's a, a medical condition that you're under such stress that it breaks the little capillaries and they, they break over into your... The, it's like you sweat blood. But it's really, you've got to be under tremendous stress for that to happen. Well, that's where he strove against sin. What would, what would have been the sin? I'm not going to the cross. That's where he strove against sin himself. And he won. You think he can't relate with you when you're striving against it? Sure he can. He can relate. We don't have a high priest that cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He can. He's been there. Okay. Verse 2. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. Now, this suffering here is talking about victory over sin. You can tell that, he, just keep reading. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. So there he might cross over into a little persecution for righteousness sake. Well, who do they think they are? They're so holy, you know, okay? But the first thing he's talking about is you stepping away from all of this stuff, lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings. Y'all better quit that. <laughs> now, other places, Galatians 5, he starts talking about envy, greed, jealousy, which to me are the more difficult sins to be free from. But as you're growing... And if, as you're separating from addictions of whatever kind they might be, today one of the biggest ones is internet pornography. Men and women, I hear, you know. It's an addiction like anything else. It feeds, there's chemicals in your brain it produces, it, it, your brain likes it. And when you stop it, there's going to be withdrawals, normally. That suffering while you get free is okay with God. All right, let's look at another kind. Go to Titus. Chapter 2, Titus, it's right after the Timothys. I love the way this is worded. It's not just the grace of God, but the grace of God that brings salvation. <laughs> what is the grace of God that brings salvation? Did I tell you where to look? Titus. 2 verse 11 Titus 2 verse 11 
and 12 we're going to look at. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. And that grace teaches us something. It teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. <clears throat> Denying ungodliness. And that's to born-again Christians. Denying it. Meaning, it still wants you. And there may be something in you that still wants it. Okay? Yes, sir. I, I, now, this is Gary talking and not the Word. And you can throw this out. That's okay. This journey for me, I'm not talking about Darren. I'm not talking about others. I'm talking about Gary. Sue and I, the day we walked through the doors of the prayer center, uh, we should have had a t-shirt and a, and, a, and a hat that said, Strongholds are us. And we didn't know that, though. You know, we, all we knew was we was messed up and our way was not working. <clears throat> we didn't know that. As we heard Dave teach, and it took about six months for me to be convinced, and I began putting into practice. Uh, See, so it's one thing to be a hearer of the word, another thing to be a doer of the word. And I began to do it, and God had me in the perfect job. I had no excuse. I was in a job where I could basically be paid to pray. All I had to do was just start praying. And uh, so I did. Well, we, we've talked about the revelation type things that began to happen and the visions and all of that. That's one side of the coin. But the other side of the coin is he starts purging, wants to purge Gary. Remember that day that I'd been praying for so long and I didn't know, I hadn't had a vision or nothing? I said, what? Do you mind me asking, what are you doing during this long time of prayer? And I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm driving the money changers from the temple. There was greed in st still inside of Gary even after all those years of being a Christian. Now, Greed had taken a body blow 12 years before. Because if you want to see greed, I used to be greed with legs. And I really was. Everything I, every decision was made somehow about everything I did was about money, always. And uh, it took a real body blow when we got saved. But sure enough, you know, there was still some ites living in the promised land. <laughs> there were greedites and selfishites and exaltites. <laughs> <laughs> Those exaltites, you got to really watch them. <laughs> well, he's driving the money changers from the temple. And I remembered that verse immediately. I remembered that passage where Jesus made that whip and overturned the tables of the money changers and he drove them out, you know. And he, by his spirit, he was doing that. So he's purging me of the love of money. Well, that teaching went on for a while, quite a while. And then one day again, the trainer comes. And basically, he starts giving us instructions that to me, seems like he put us out on a limb where there was no fruit and then he sawed the tree off behind us and we had to stand there on that limb and learn how to believe him for every biscuit every every bite that we ate every tank of gas everything because where he was taking us we had to learn those things well boy in that process there was suffering in the flesh now this was more in the emotional realm I'd have trouble sleeping at night I mean, I'm having trouble falling asleep. I, don't, I didn't used to when I was just a nice, selfish Christian. <laughs> but here now, he's trying to obey him. Remember this thing started off with obey him, work out your own salvation. In other words, do what he tells you. Here, obeying him has brought me into this place now where, man, the, the bills are coming due again. There's, I look, there's nothing in the account, nothing in the checkbook, nothing nowhere. You know? <laughs> The tank is, the, ga the gauge is bouncing off the E again on the gas tank. And there's no paycheck coming Friday, no nothing normal coming, you know. And boy, you try and sleep at night. The enemy, man, I'll tell you, he'll, there was suffering. And then I'd remember all those early tapes by other teachers that were good ones and they, about learning how not to worry. I said, well, I love those when I heard them. I don't love them so much now. I mean, I felt like I need to worry. I wasn't responsible if I wasn't worrying. Oh, God. <laughs> there was a suffering. And I'd have to, that thing about to cast the whole of your cares. I like to fell out of my chair the first time I heard Dave describe that. He says, I, I don't know how many services I went to. And they'd have an altar call. Come and leave your cares at the altar. I've been in those too. 
You come and you, oh, with everything you know how, Lord, I, I leave this care right here. I'm not worried about my bills. I'm not worried about this. I'm not worried about that. I leave the cares at the altar. And maybe at that moment, something you feel pretty good. <laughs> Trouble is on your drive home. You're driving a Volkswagen. Your cares are driving a Ferrari. <laughs> They're already back home when you get there. And it's suffering again. It's suffering. There is this suffering as you're learning to obey him, you know. <laughs> hmm. we're going to run out of time we're in 1st Peter right no we're in Titus go on over to 1st Peter we better get over there we're not going to make it hallelujah chapter 4 now where we work where we looked first was verses 1 and 2 and so much in here I'd like to go line upon line maybe someday we will Come on down to verse 12, though. Let's, let's look at 12 through 19. Now, this is talking about persecution for righteousness' sake. See, this is the other kind. Those that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Jesus promised us, if they hated me, they will hate you also. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. And more and more, even in this nation... We're seeing that come to pass. So verse 12 starts off saying, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice, inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings. Well, you don't hear many messages on that, do you? Partakers of Christ's sufferings. That when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you. We better practice that ahead of time, I think. We better start practicing that now. I'll tell you a word that, uh, that uh, when I get, I don't get a whole lot yet. I get some, you know, persecution, not a whole lot. But the words that always, and, and there's part of me that does rejoice because I always remember the words, beware when all men speak well of you. Beware. Something's wrong. You, you know, your witness is not bright enough. Okay. But if you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you. For the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is evil spoken of. But on your part, he is glorified. Okay, now that's talking about persecution for righteousness' sake, obviously. And the Lord is okay with that. If I had time, I'd have looked up other verses. He says, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father. How straight is that, you know? But, but let none of you suffer. Here's the kind of suffering that's not of God. Let none of you suffer as a murderer <laughs> or as a thief. Or as an evildoer, boy, these are heinous, aren't they? I always like to teach it that it's, it's progressively more heinous. So he's talking about murder and a thief and an evildoer, and even worse than that is a busybody in other men's affairs, other men's matters. I, I'm teasing a little bit. But it's, do you notice how it's all linked in the same verse? Busybody. It's amazing to me when people first get filled with the Holy Ghost, their tendency is to have a word for somebody else. And the truth of the matter is, God's probably got more words for them than they care to, uh, care to hear. <laughs> Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. But let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? 
Wherefore, let him that, if you want to underline, here's the title, suffer according to the will of God. There is suffering that is according to the will of God. Two kinds that I can see, striving against sin. When the flesh fights against you, there's a suffering. That suffering is okay. You will win. And that suffering, by the way, will eventually cease. The other one is suffering persecution for righteousness sake. And that's the kind he's talking about here. Wherefore let them that suffer according to the will of God. Commit the keeping of their souls to him. In well doing. As unto a faithful creator. Now just so, do you love meditation? Do you love the laws of meditation? Do you know what's coming in the next chapter? Come on down to verse 7. Casting all your care upon him. Even when you're in the midst of suffering, even when they're going to burn you at the stake, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Hallelujah. This year, my flesh has suffered. <laughs> withdrawals from all kinds of stuff and every time I just let it free just a little bit I can I can tell it's like a ravening monster it would go crazy if I let it okay I don't ever plan to let it again all right that's my plan <laughs> pray for Gary <laughs> okay but there's a suffering there's a suffering involved okay now someday maybe my, my palate will be completely transformed oh God let it happen Oh God, I love beets and lettuce and anyway. <laughs> and I, I, I despisest thou Krispy Kreme donut thing, thou evil uh, let lurketh. <laughs> but I'm not there yet. <laughs> and every time I got to push away the fried chicken and reach for the Caesar salad, there is a suffering. But God's okay with that. He'd rather I do what I can to be a good steward of this vessel. Do my part. Now, he is my health. Don't get me wrong. I'm not a... He is my health. But by golly, I, golly, is that okay? I think, I believe he wants us to be good stewards of what he gives us. So I'm trying. And there's a suffering involved. Well, in this land, I thank God that we're praying for revival. I've given up completely on politics saving our nation. We've got to have revival. We've got to have revival. It doesn't matter now who they put in there, I think. But God can still give godly leaders. I mean, I'm going to vote, don't get me wrong. But that's not where my hope is at all. My hope is in God. We've got to have revival. And I am glad I go to this church. <laughs>